you know, I, I mean, we're not at that point yet where we have to really worry about it, but it's coming that way. She's going to have to take a couple months off because this uh, is yeah, a major, that's, that's you know. Definitely major. Yeah, yeah. So she'll be on disability for a while. Anyway. Yeah. Should I call his work or something? Yeah, uh, call his work. Okay. And I was thinking three things we could talk about with him, and, and we can go off on other things. Um, the Red Sox, because he's a big Red Sox fan. Dave Albee. Dave Albee. Yeah, it is yeah. Edward Brown and Bruce McGowan. Edward, how you doing, Bruce? How you doing? Yeah, good, good. good. How you doing, man? Hold on a second. Let me close my, my office door. Hold on, please. Okay. And we can talk a little bit with him about his um, some of the interesting stories he's got. Yeah. He basically kind of did what I did for many, many years, only in the newspaper. So he's, What's up, gentlemen? All right. So, hey, Dave, I was thinking here's what we would kind of discuss, and we can throw it around, and Edward, uh, if he has any ideas, it's very informal. Um... I thought it'd be kind of fun to start off because you're a New England guy. Uh, talk about the impact of the Red Sox winning these last three championships, kind of similar to what has happened out here with the Giants, only even more so. Yeah. And and you as a New Englander, you know, you're you're out here removed, but you grew up there. And then um, then we can get into some interesting stories about things that you've covered here in the Bay Area, and then also finally the the transition from becoming go, getting out of the media and going into you know. Relation, uh, which wasn't my choice. But which wasn't your choice. We can, we can talk. Yeah, we can talk about that. Yeah. Talk about that because yeah, we, we, we try to uh, cover a lot of the uh, yeah. business aspects of sports. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Okay. We can. Yeah, I'll let I'll let Edward take the, the lead here, and we'll just bounce okay. it back and forth and we'll have fun. All right. So the uh, first uh, couple of minutes is just sort of an uh, intro by Bruce and me, just to explain like what we're going to be going over. Okay. So sure. you can kind of hang out with us. Just here. hang out. It takes about a minute and a half. Yeah. All right. Okay. Here we go. Okay. Welcome, you're listening to Sports Econ 101. This is the show where we discuss sports topics from a business perspective. I'm your host, Edward Brown, along with my co-host, Bruce McGowan, longtime sports radio personality. Uh, today's show is going to be kind of fun because of our guest. Who's our guest? Well, he's a good friend of ours uh, for many years. Here in Marin County, Dave Albee was working with the Marin Independent Journal as a longtime columnist, covered all the big stories uh, from the 49ers of the 1980s to, uh, more recently, the Giants. But uh, Dave has made the transition, as, as I have in some respects, out of the media on a full-time basis and into another area, and he's going to talk about that. But he's also from New England, so we want to talk about the, the Boston Red Sox because he grew up with that team, and what a what a joy it's been to see maybe, them uh, maybe, so successful. Maybe the old Boston Patriots, too. Well, yeah, yeah, you yeah. never know. Maybe I, that's been quite a story, too. The last, I mean, psh, God, a lot of people are saying they're going to win it all again this year with Tom Brady and, and Belichick. Why not? Why not? Yeah. All right, at each commercial break, we're going to ask a sports trivia question where we're going to be giving away vacations to the first email with the correct answer. Those vacations are not sponsored by the radio station, but by Lighthouse Resort and Marina, and those vacations are free. They're only requested a $100 cleaning fee to cover the housekeeping expenses. Check them out at lighthouseresortandmarina.com. And uh, today's special, uh, or excuse me, today's trivia contest is going to just be uh, miscellaneous sports questions. Sounds right? good to me. And don't forget to check out on the or click on the box paintball tickets on Sports Econ 101. I gotta try that sometime. Yeah, I tell you, yeah. it's, it's a lot of fun. And uh, the if you click on it, I believe the uh, it's like eighty five percent off. Wow, I mean it's really really inexpensive. Eighty five percent off on the on the, uh, the retail. Yeah, yeah that's so great. It's really really expensive. Okay. And, uh, I think their only catch is that you gotta buy the actual paintballs at the. Venues, but it's venues all around the country, and they're it's pretty inexpensive. The ammunition that doesn't hurt you. Um, it can sting a little bit. <laughs> it depends on how how far it's pumped up. Uh, okay. All right. This segment of Sports Econ 101 is sponsored by Pacific Private Money, providing mortgage investments that are currently yielding over eight percent, secured by Bay Area real estate. It doesn't get any more conservative than that. Check them out at PacificPrivateMoney.com. Don't touch that dial. You're listening to Sports Econ 101. We'll be right back with our guest, Dave Alvey. All right, so. All right, Dave. Thank How's you. your day going, by the way? <laughs> You're doing great so far, Dave. Hey, Dave, what? what? You guys, you guys just started a ship. I'll just yeah. uh, off on the board. Hey, Dave, what is your official title there? I'm the Associate Director of Communications and Media Relations uh, there you go. at Dominican Oops. University. Uh -huh. Okay. Dominican University, not Dominican yeah, College. Right, no longer Dominican College. Dominican okay. University. Of yeah, gotcha. How long have you been there now? Has it been since seven, seven years? Uh, I have. Yeah. So you got you got out of the IJ in uh, would have been in 09? Oh nine. I just have like ten oh, seconds yeah. recording my radio show. Okay. What's up? That's right about the time I started it uh, for about a year. Okay. At, uh, I never okay. got to see him. In the, I never get to cover him in the World Series. Yeah, you know that's a bummer. I mean, 
I, I really pretty much stopped on a regular basis being a reporter and going into the clubhouse yeah. in 08. Because right. in 09, when I worked for uh, Comcast Sportsnet, I was, I was Papa's uh, producer. I'd go out to a lot of games, but I wasn't yeah. doing the interviews. And then I've done a little freelance work, but uh, not, not a whole okay. lot. Yeah. But I did get to go to all the, all the World Series now, playoffs, yeah. so I can't yeah. complain. Hey, hey, okay. I miss the press box. They don't really miss the clubhouse or the locker room. Yeah, it gets to, well, you know, and especially now, it's not that the players are, the, the giant is. players okay, are a great you. bunch of guys, but they're just, they, the players today are less and less involved than they ever have been. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Although, the other night at the 49er game, I, I had to get a guest, and I, I went up to Eric Armistead, gave him the phone to do a little Q&A, and he was you know, great about it. That's right. Yeah, so I did the same thing last year with all these NFL, uh, you know, you get some of these guys, they're pretty, uh, football and basketball players, I think, are a little easy to deal with. Yeah. Because they don't see us as much. <laughs> Familiarity breeds contempt. <laughs> I went and saw the Red Sox when the A's were coming through town uh, for a couple of games, and it's like I didn't even recognize the A's lineup other than Oh, I know. Well, they've turned it over four or five times since <laughs> since uh, '09. You know, it's ridiculous. Like a college team. Yep. Yeah. 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 All right. All right. Are we ready? Yes. Okay. Let's let you start. Okay. Okay. Welcome back to Sports Econ 101. Again, I'm Edward Brown, your host, along with Bruce McGowan. Bruce, who do we have on the phone? Now we got Dave Alby, who was a longtime sports columnist here in the North Bay, just north of San Francisco in Marin County, with the Independent Journal for, I believe it was close to 30 years, maybe not quite that long, but close to it, and now has made the transition um, to working for a college, Dominican University, a very fine uh, private school here in Marin County. He's the assistant director of communications and media relations. And Dave, I've got to ask you the question for our listeners. You know, they're saying, why would he get out of uh, sports journalism to do this? It wasn't something you chose, was it? <laughs> well, well, first of all, Bruce, it wasn't, it wasn't 30 years, but it felt like 30 years. It was actually, 20, it was actually 23 years. 23 years. Um, the choice of, of getting out of, uh, of, you know, I had been in the newspaper industry for 35 years from Maine. I, went, I worked for newspapers from Maine to Colorado, Illinois to here in Marin, and had been in the business for 35 years. And I became sort of a casualty, the classic casualty of the, the, the dwindling uh, newspaper business. And uh, uh, was one day called in the office and said, uh, we don't need you anymore. Wow. And so it's how I sort of uh, get out of that business and how I get into this business is uh interesting story because I was only out of work for about two weeks and got a call from Dominican University and that time they were hiring a new athletic director, uh, Terry Toomey, at uh, Dominican and they wanted to put on a, a big news conference, press conference, and, and do a big splash and asked me if I would come and be a media consultant for them on a press conference and uh, contacted people like yourself and other reporters I'd worked with and, and they were generous with their time and, and understood the situation. And, we had a real great turnout um, for the press conference, and they called me back and said, listen, we'd like to have you um, introduce uh, Terry to all the sports people you know in Puerto Rico sports that we know in Marin County, since they'll be here, and uh, I spent a few weeks with Terry, and the next thing I know, they said, well, they called me in and said, would you like to have a you know, full-time job here? And, well, I had nothing else going, so. <laughs> <laughs> well, that, that's not bad. Great opportunity. I'm yeah. eternally grateful to Dominican University for giving me this opportunity and yeah. making the transition. Yeah, actually, we have something in common, because back in 1985, I approached Dominican University, and I was the uh, person who kind of started off teaching the income tax department. I don't know really? if you still have it, but... Is that uh, right? Yeah. Yeah, it was really fun. I, um, uh, Brad Van Alstead, is he still there? He's still there. He's, he's, still, he's, he's chair guy. of the communications department, communications wow. and media studies department. Good guy. Yeah, he's a good guy. Yeah. That's a great story. And Dave, as we mentioned, you started uh, working in Maine, but you grew up in New England. Yeah. You grew up in Maine. So obviously, Maine is, is an outlier area from, from Boston, but people in Maine, you know, really tie themselves emotionally to the Boston Red Sox. What did it mean? I know you're far removed from, from Boston, but what did it mean for the Red Sox to win in 04 and 07 and 13 after all these many, many years? You know, people have been born and died, families that. You know, two two generations of families that lived by the time the, the Red Sox finally won it all. Well, that, the whole thing that changed, it was 1967. That was the yeah. impossible dream. You know, I mean, that was a team that had the 101 odds and won the pennant, went to the World Series, and lost seven games to the Cardinals. That was a season that changed everything for, for the Red Sox and their fans. I mean, all of a sudden, beginning with 67, the expectations have been incredibly high ever since. And I just remember, and I think Peter Gammons has told this story, but it was very true. I live in a small town in Maine. And you could literally walk downtown and go by and hear the game from house to house because everybody was sort of sitting out on their porch with a game on, and you could actually follow the game as you walked down the street <laughs> downtown. 
type thing. So that, that's, that's sort of the craze that came about. I mean, everybody was just sort of enamored with the team in 67, and it's been that way ever since. And, and obviously, being a lifelong Red Sox fan, uh, I had to wait a long time for the, the championship to, ha to, to happen. Well, the, the thing was great was in, in 04, the way it happened. You know, the way it happened beating the yeah, Yankees. Yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't, they could have lost that World Series, and I still would have been happy. Just the fact that they, they finally yeah, got up on, on the Yankees because that was the Eagle Empire, the team that was always in the way. And, how that happened was incredible, and, and um, um, you know, is, ESPN is still chronicling it on uh, Florida and <laughs> Silver, so, yeah. and, I, and I get choked up in tears after I watch that. Sure. Oh, yeah, I mean, they're down three games to nothing. I think the fourth game was in New York, wasn't it? And the, and the Red Sox pulled it out? And that was the first time it ever happened. The, fourth, the, the final two games yes. were in New York in Yankee Stadium, and they wow. pulled them out okay. the last game. That was okay. a, it's just, a, it's just, a, just a, you know, a, a great moment, and, uh, you know, and everything go their way that 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 series uh, when everything has gone not gone that way in previous World Series. So I got a, I got a quick story to tell you relating to this, and this is going back to 1986. I was with a buddy of mine. I worked in New York in '81, and he was a diehard Mets fan. And we're up uh, hiking in Mount Washington in, in, in New Hampshire. Uh, I went back east to, to visit my buddy, and we're watching the sixth game of the 1986 World Series in the hotel room. As we're gonna get, we just had a bite to eat. We've done our hike earlier in the day. We're watching this incredible game. And of course, that's the game where Mookie Wilson and uh, you know Buckner and all that happened, and, and the Red Sox blew it in the ninth inning. And the next day, they two days later they lost it. But I, I'll never forget. In the next room, there were four or five Red Sox fans apparently. And when uh, the ball went through Buckner's legs, I heard all these anguished screams and smashing of furniture. And the manager came in and kicked these guys out. And I, I, I walked outside and looked inside this room next to ours, and it looked as if a tornado had hit it. <laughs> I mean, these fans were really upset. So you, you realize how important it is, uh, baseball, for people who like baseball in New England. Well, and, and well, especially. I was, in, I was in Milwaukee during Game 6 of the uh, 86 World Series, and I was covering the, the 49ers were playing the Packers at County mm -hmm. Stadium. That's when the Packers used to play two games a year at uh, Milwaukee County Stadium. So I was back there. In fact, the quarterback that day for the 49ers was Mike Moroski. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Both uh, the Montana was hurt, and this is before Steve Young, and the backup was Jeff Kent, and he was hurt. So Mike Moroski gets a start. So he's one of the guys who threw a touchdown pass to Jerry Rice in his career. Anyways, <laughs> at, after the game, or that night before, I'm in a place called the State House in Milwaukee. It's this sort of odd, quirky bar, and, and I'm watching the game, and I'm sort of by myself, you know, no friends and stuff. I just happen to go in so I can see the game. And my premonition on that thing before the Buckner thing was the agony of seeing John McNamara coming out of the bullpen and tapping his right arm to call in Bob Stanley from the bullpen. <laughs> and people will forget it was it was the tying run, the winning run yeah. came in on Buckner Zero, but the tying run was basically a, a wild pitch slash yeah. pass ball with with Rich Gedman that allowed the tying run in. That was the that was the one that people forget about, just like everyone forgets about the Bernie Carbo three run home run in game um of the 75 World Series when Fisk won it was a game winner. Mm. Yeah, there's so many little twists and turns. That's the, the, the great thing about baseball. And, and you know, that's the fun part I think Dave understands, and I do too, from having been around sports for so long when you're at the games, and you get to see this history. And it's, you know, you have all these memories, and it, you can't put a, a dollar figure or any kind of a, uh, an ego thing on that because it's all you know just for fun. Well, and also the, the whole Steve Bartman thing. Everyone thinks about Bartman, they all forget about all the errors that happened before it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. What, uh, you know, Dave, we were talking about you know covering uh, the 49ers in the 1980s. You were there, I was there, and, and we were there for almost all of the big games. And you went on the road a lot, and I went luckily to a couple of Super Bowls. How would you describe that team? You know, it, it's always comparisons are always difficult to make and sometimes unfair to make. I, I think somebody once used the term "comparison is a thief of joy." <laughs> yeah. uh, I have to agree with that because it's just it's unfortunate. But what, you know, that team to me from 1981 to 1998, every single year they were competitive, with the exception yeah. of one year. I mean, how did they keep that up for so long? Well, I think it, obviously you had great coaching. Um, you had a great a great quarterback. Know, a succession of great quarterbacks, but it also goes down to the great owner. And I'm glad Eddie DeBartolo got, got inducted into the Hall of Fame this year because he sort of set the tone there. I mean, he, he created a family atmosphere. The rules were different then, so they could they could uh, get the players they wanted to get. They could they could bring in great players and tail the great twilight of their career and, and, and get mileage out of them. And it just just the atmosphere he created and how much Eddie wanted to win. 
Mm. Um, that's the sort of, sort of thing that stand, stands out. And I think that that competitiveness from the owner to the coach to the entire team was passed down. And, uh, you know, they were a tremendous road team, too. They went on the road all the time and, and with hostile environments. And, and, and that's, that's a mark of a championship team when you can win in a road and, and the chips are down all the time. And, uh, again, you get, you get lucky with the quarterbacks, but you also get lucky with, you know, with the general manager and, and the drafting of players. John McVay was a, 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 an incredible um, uh, point of stability for that organization. Hey, Dave, stay with us. We have to cut to a quick break. Sure. Okay. All right. So here, and if you know the answer to this, don't answer it now. We'll let you answer when we come back from break. All right. <laughs> Here's our first question. What time? I, oh, we made a mistake on it. Okay. Here's our first question. What quarterback threw 70 passes in a seven, single game? 70 wow. passes. Wow. Yeah. In an NFL game. In an NFL game. Wow. All right. Okay. So uh, email edward at sportsecon101.com. The answer to that question. Don't touch that dial. We're going to be right back. All right. We're not taking you away from anything pressing, are we, Dave? No, I, I get some press releases out and just sort of sitting here right now waiting for the day okay. to end. So you know, I get some more things to do, but nothing yeah. pressing. The major stuff's out of the way today. Yeah, I was going to I was gonna think the answer to that question, it was, it was kind of, it's an odd, yeah, it's an odd yeah. question. It's an odd question, but it's, and it's not our, uh, I'm trying to think who threw that many. I, it's, it's, it's funny because it's funny today, I mean, what is it, 60 to 70% of the time they're passing nowadays? Yeah, I know that. I'm trying to think of the quarterback. Yeah. Like, you know, something, or some, something, someone like a Sam Bradford. Yeah, it wasn't somebody who was, you know, Hall of Fame quality or even maybe All Pro. But right. Yeah. I'm yeah. Back yeah. In the day, though, it's 70 passes. Probably it was fairly recently, wasn't it? No, oh, College of Rangers throw 70 passes. <laughs> <laughs> well, you mentioned Mike Morosky. Who went that? Was it Novato High or Sam? Novato High School. Okay. Yeah. 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 In fact, I was going to ask you. Maybe I'll. Uh, I'm going to ask you this on the air. Okay. Okay. So All let's right. answer this question. Sure. You also know that I was probably the first person to see Jared Goff. That's right. Uh, oh, okay. We'll uh, talk about that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We should talk about Jared Goff. Yeah. I covered Jerry, and I was at Jerry at that time. Jer- Jerry Goff. Living at a yeah. house. I think it was, I think it was either, I can't know, either her house or her parents' house or his parents' house in San Rafael across the freeway from this. And I went down to do a story on Jerry the offseason. And Jared was just a toddler then. I remember we were seeing him. And that was oh. the only time I saw him. Wow. You know, face to face is when he was like a year old and just learning to walk. Wow. We've got to talk about that. We'll talk about that this yeah. minute because everyone asks you the question. Yeah. Here we go. Well, welcome back to Sports Econ 101. Edward Brown here along with Bruce McGowan. Here was our first trivia question. What quarterback threw for 70 passes in a single game? I'm going to let Dave take a, a stab at that one because I, I have no clue. <laughs> <laughs> I have no clue. I, I, like I said, I seen, it seems like it's someone, someone like a Sam Bradford did that. Okay, this would have been in the 1990s. The 1990s. Mm. Give me the, the exact date, 19, or the exact year, 1994. 1994. Wow. Pretty well-known quarterback? Yeah. Um, yeah. How, what, how, how many completions out of 70? Uh, I don't have the answer. Oh. Uh, one. I'm, no, no, no I, I, I'm guessing <laughs> probably 40. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, Drew Bledsoe. Drew Bledsoe, oh, the that. predecessor to uh, to Tom Brady. Tom Brady. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, Dave Albee, you worked for many years for the Marin IJ, which is a, you know fairly small paper. And when Bruce had mentioned about the fact that you know you've been on the road a lot, I'm thinking, how does a small paper like that afford to pay <laughs> to have you fly around the country? Here's a story you want to hear. At that time, before I came to the IJ, I was working for the Rockford, Illinois Register Star, and that was a member of the Gannett Newspaper Group. Which included, the, which was led by the, the, the mothership on USA Today, and Gannett wanted to uh, start a Sunday newspaper at the IHA in Marin. This was in 1986. Wanted to start a Sunday, so a Sunday launch team. So they basically brought an all-star team of people from Gannett out to California to do it. And I was sort of selected to be the sports columnist. And they were it was a high-profile project. So Gannett was still throwing a lot of money into this project. So I come out here, and I'm looking for paper at that time was probably about 30,000 circulation. I'm traveling with the 49ers, I'm traveling with the Giants, I'm traveling with the A's, I'm traveling with Cal and Stanford football and basketball, going in with it, spending all kinds of money. So it was sort of a big project, and I happened to come on, and we were sending, my stories were not only appearing in the IJ, but they were sending in that news service, and also USA Today occasionally would pick up my byline and run a story, especially when the Sharks get in the playoffs oh, yeah. for the first time. Uh, so that was sort of the way it came about, and then eventually the, the money dried out, and, and uh, it had sold the, the paper, and uh, that was sort of the, 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 
that the, the wheels of apply to parchment. Okay, so that that's really how it worked is the fact that there was a big mothership basically covering the Yeah, they were, they wanted to be, I think Gannett was paying all of our expenses at the beginning. They wanted to be sort of half IJ, half uh, uh, Gannett, and then, uh, you know, eventually the IJ merged with the Oakland Tribune, the San Jose Mercury News, and then the Alameda Newspaper Group, I think it's called the Bay Area News Group yeah. now. Uh-huh. And once that happened, they're going to send their people as opposed to sending the guy from the small mm. Hey, I got it just offhand. Do you know Andrew Small? Yes, I do. Yeah, yeah. Andy and I worked together. Andy was coming when I first came in '86. Andy was the uh, 49ers beat writer. Yeah, he was, right. Andy and I were very, very good friends when we were growing up. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Okay. It's one of those strange things. I was like, oh, that's right. Andy writes sports. Yeah, yeah, Andy, Andy was when I when I first came out. Andy was the 49ers beat writer. Wow. Another another name from the past, uh, Jerry Goff, the father of Jared Goff. Now, for you NFL fans, Jared Goff, the top draft pick of the LA Rams, hasn't played as we speak. But his dad was a you know a fair major league player for about eight seasons with I believe Toronto and Texas catcher. Grew up here in Marin County in San Rafael. And I guess tell us the story about you did some kind of a feature on him and actually met Jared Goff, the, the young uh, the son of yeah, Jerry. A couple a couple of stories I'll tell you. This is what. Jerry was starting out. Uh, I caught him in the off season at that time. He was living in a house in uh, in San Rafael, and I went over to visit him, do a, like an off season story on him before he went to spring training. And this is after they had their first child, uh, Jared. So I, I guess I could say I was the first one to ever lay eyes on Jared, or, or among the media, anyways. And I was interviewing Jerry, and Jared was then just learning to walk. And I remember him walking down into the living room while I was conducting the interview with. With, uh, with the uh, with father, the, and, he, and he probably still could throw 30 yards. He takes the binky and throws it across the yard. Go ahead. Yeah. But but I, 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 I've, never spoken, I've never spoken to Jared. I've talked, I think I've talked to Jerry several times since then, but I've never spoken to Jared. And obviously when Jerry's career at Marin Catholic and then on the Cal started, I was no longer in the business of the IJ, and I sort of regret that because that's something I would have followed all the way through. Sure. Uh, I, I think my, one of my joys of working at the IJ was being able to follow Marin uh, athletes, yeah. uh, you know, from from their roots here, and you know, I, I got to know Steve Lavin really well, got to know Pete, Pete Carroll very well, um, you know, and I really enjoyed the time I get to, to, to spend with them and, and do stories on them. Uh, my my best, my favorite uh, Jerry Goff story. In fact, I told uh, Jared Bell the story before uh, uh, the draft uh, this year. Uh, Jerry was a was a like Bruce mentioned. Jerry was a, 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 a a catcher, I think he played for like three organizations. He was drafted through the, through the Expos, but he was playing for, he played for the Pirates. Uh, he played, uh, when I last talked to him, he was a catcher for the Astros. Mm. And he owns a dubious record, major league record. I don't know if you knew that yes, or not. Yes, I know about that. Yeah, tell us though. Most pass balls in a game. Oh. How many? Six. Six? And what, who, Six was, who was the pitcher? Was yeah. it one pitcher who was throwing all those? It, you know, it wasn't one pitcher, but none of them were knuckleballers. Oh. Uh, the game he did is he was playing playing for the Astros in uh, Olympic Stadium in Montreal, and he had the, the it was like a, I can't remember the day of the week, it was like a Sunday. He had to set the record on a Sunday, I believe it was a Sunday, and uh, six pass balls, and again, none of them were, he just had one of those bad days, and none of the pitchers were knuckleballs, so it really had no excuse for it, just bad day. So they went to um, Chicago after that, on a road trip, and uh, I caught up with him on the phone, I think on Tuesday, uh, for the game. He had gone out Monday night, and Friends of his from San Rafael High School had flown in for the game in Chicago and spent some time with him. And they went out. I think they went on to um, what was the, uh, they went out to a nightclub that night, some playing. And the friends with him and, and Jerry just wanted to forget about the previous day and just kind of erase the memory of the whole, you know, major league record pass ball and stuff like that. So he's with a friend and they go into a restaurant in this bar and they're standing at in front of the urinal and you know places. Places like that, sports bars, they put the daily newspaper. <laughs> the oh, man. So this guy, the friend of Jerry, comes up and says, you know, side by side in the urinals, and the friend turns to Jerry and goes, don't look up. <laughs> <laughs> don't look up. And of course, Jerry yeah. looks up there. He looks right in the headlines. He's the Sun Times, the Chicago Tribune, uh, saying, golf, gas, lead to, uh, you know, exposed victory, or something like oh, that. Yeah. Well, you know, something that reminds you, I was just looking in the IJ yesterday and reading about, uh, it was the 30 year anniversary of Bob Renly. Oh, Bob, Bob, Bob yeah. yeah. Now, now, for those that don't know, this is uh, this is an amazing story. Can you yeah. tell us the story, Dave? 
No, I'll let you tell the story because I wasn't there that day. Okay. Well, basically what happened was Bob Brindley uh, was playing third base, I believe, that yeah, day. Yes. Yeah. And he committed four errors. And I think three in of them. One, in one inning. Well, he, yeah. yeah and, and, and the team was losing late in the game. He had a couple of base hits. He had a home run. Then late in the game, he hits another home run. And lo and behold, late in the game, the score is tied. He hits the game-winning home run. Yeah. So you talk about a guy who lived both sides of the... Uh, the classic you know. goat to hero story. Yeah. 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 Well, that's what fans are hoping out here for, as we speak. The Giants had the best record in the first half. Yeah. They've had the worst record in the second half. It's been the strangest baseball season I can ever remember. Well, in reading, reading the story yesterday, I had to crack up. I, I was literally at the gym reading the paper while I'm riding the exercise bike, and I just break out laughing because I didn't know this part of it, but uh, when Michael Lacoste was taken out of the game, and he goes, well, why don't you take him out of the game? Yeah. Pointing to Brenly, right? And <laughs> that sounds like Michael Lacoste. <laughs> and and Brenly points to uh, points to Roger Craig, and he goes, he goes, it's not my fault, it's his fault for putting me in here. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> that's so Buffy. Yeah, that's Buffy. And, that's, and, it, and for those that don't know Bob Brenly there, well, Bob Brenly not only was a fine uh, ball player for several years, but he managed a team to a World Series championship in Arizona, and then became in between before and after was a broadcaster. So you talk about a guy who, kind of like Dave Albee here, our guest, uh, who's been a, a sports col a sports columnist. And now tell us a little bit about your job, though, because the transition from going from being a sports columnist to working in media relations, you're kind of on the up opposite side of the of the wall, so to speak. I'm on the dark side now. <laughs> <laughs> it's not a promotion, huh? <laughs> Instead of looking for news, I'm trying to, to keep news, uh, you know, I, I control the news. Or, or create it, maybe, you know. Yeah, that's yeah. It. No, it's a different, it's, it's a lot of the skill set I had uh, as a reporter is applied to this. I'm still a people person. I'm still, you know, I'm given the opportunity to do profiles. And that's one of the best parts of my job, favorite parts of my job, is when I have students, students student athletes come into my office and do little profiles on them. So when I get a chance to talk to them and see how excited they are about the university, you know, and I've got two children about the same age, and uh, it's just great to hear the excitement these 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 students have, these young young men and young women have, and, and what their dreams are, and and how Dominican is helping them achieve that dream, and it, that's that's my favorite part of my job. I, I you know, and, and it, fortunately I I get an opportunity to still do some writing and stuff, the creative writing that I was used to with the IJ, but it's still nevertheless it's an opportunity to. to have a, a relationship with somebody, establish a relationship with somebody, have an interview with them, and just really enjoy the company and, and the conversation. Well, well you know, you know, what's really fun is uh, Stuart Horn had gotten us set up uh, yeah. to do the biz, our business. I, have a, I also have a uh, radio show that does uh, strictly business, and we were recording at Dominican University yeah. uh, for uh, just a semester. And uh, a guy named Hunter Hornstein was uh, yeah. Oh, he, yeah, heard you know, of that guy. Yeah, he's a very nice guy. Yeah, he was a good, uh, good intern. Yeah, and then uh, basically, then they expanded to start doing the Pacific, and that's when I had to set up everything in my office. Interesting that you mentioned that, because I worked with Stuart Horn, and we did the Pacifics on internet radio for a year, and that was one of the most enjoyable jobs I ever had, uh, working here in Santa Fe, just doing all the home games, and Dave knows about that, although he was by that time out of working as a writer, but he's been, yeah. you know, kind Stuart, of... Stuart Horn is now my, uh, is my son's public speaking teacher instructor. Really? Oh, very good. Wow. Yeah. Good guy. Okay, hey guys, we're going to cut to our second commercial break here. This one's a little easier. What 1990 championship sporting event attracted a TV audience of over a billion people? Whoa. All right. Okay. And it was not the curling championship in the main. <laughs> All right. Uh, first email with correct answer is going to win that free three day, two nights day at the Lighthouse Resort. Email edward at sportsecon101.com. The answer to this question What 1990? You can see we're all old here. Uh, these questions are what, 25? Plus years 26 old. years old, yeah. <laughs> 1990 was 26 years I ago? Know. Can you can imagine? Oh my gosh. I, I was even old back then. <laughs> what 1990 championship sporting event attracted a TV audience of over a billion people? Wow. You know, in fact, people, my kids tease me that I'm so old that when I was in uh, uh, high school, history was only a 15 minute class because there was Jewish history <laughs> before I was born. All right, stick with us. Sports Econ 101 will be right back. Uh, love yeah. it, love it, love it. All right. That's going to be a World Cup game. Yeah, I was going to say, World Cup or some boxing match. It's got to be. Got it. Got to be. Brazil, Argentina? Yeah, we'll, we'll find out here. Brazil, it's England. It's going to be something that's... Yeah. Got to be, yeah. you know, Germany, England, Germany, maybe Germany, Brazil. I don't know if Germany was that good in the 90s. Brazil yeah. was good. Yeah. Argentina was good. England was good back in the 90s, too. I love, you know, when I was up in um, Portland and Seattle, Dave, I worked in TV in Portland and radio in Seattle in 1979 and 80. And especially when I was in Seattle, the sounders of the... Uh, North American Soccer League was called in, 
He drew routinely twenty five, thirty thousand in the kingdom. Talk a hotbed in the north. Yeah, yeah. What what, uh, what what hockey team would you follow in Maine? Would that be the Hartford? Yeah. Oh, I, grew up, I grew up in the Esposito War era. Uh, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. But what, but is Boss is is that the closest team? Well, the closest NHL team. Yeah, I was yeah. In my town. The town I lived in was, was basically about a four-hour drive, five-hour drive away. Oh, so, so you're probably small town. I, I didn't get to see my first Red Sox game until I was a freshman in high school. So you're probably you're well over 200 miles away. Yeah, about 250 miles. Wow, away. wow. What's the name of the city, Dave? It's a small, if you look at the map, it's called Dover Foxcroft. It's hyphenated. D O V E R S O X E R. It's the Shire town of. County. What's the nearest uh, uh, city of any size to that? Bangor. Oh, okay, sure, yeah. sure. Yeah. All right, uh, we have one more segment to do with you, Dave. If uh, yeah. you're willing. Okay. Yeah, yeah. What um, What do you want to cover? Any, yeah, we'll any just we'll just we'll have some fun here. I got I got a few ideas. Okay. All, All right. right. Just bounce <laughs> off. The Patriots fan growing up. Really? Oh, let's talk. Let's football. talk some football. Let's do that. Yeah, because okay. yeah, it is football season. All right. Here we go. Welcome back to Sports Econ 101. Again, I'm Brandon House, going with Bruce right now. We have some easy trivia questions for the break. What 1990 championship sporting event attracted a TV audience of over a billion people? Yeah, if you want to take a stab at that one, I'm, I'm guessing. Well, it, had to be, yeah. it had to be a World Cup. It was the World yeah, Cup. I don't, know, I, I don't know who was in it. I just uh, know it was the World okay. Cup. Okay, <laughs> World Cup. Well, it had to be. You know, Dave was speculating maybe England and Brazil. That's That sounds like a good matchup, or, you know, who knows? Yeah. We'll have to go back. 1990 was a Pele was a, uh, Pele was a star a soccer player, so it might have been a must have been Brazil or somebody. Yeah, I hear Pele is, is he's doing okay, but he had a, some kind of an operation, and he was sort of on the sidelines there for a while. It was, it was right before the Olympics. I'm not sure how much he was involved with the Brazilian Olympics. Yeah, he, he wasn't playing. He wasn't playing. Well, he, was in, he was in like the, the torch. He was the torch bearer of the, the final torch he, opening ceremony. Yeah, he, I don't know if he was playing in 1990. He could yeah, have probably. Right. He was playing. I, when I worked in New York in 1981, he was playing for the New York Cosmos, and yeah. he was an older player, but he was still darn good. I, I saw him play in '68. For his Santos of Brazil team in an exhibition wow. game up here, and that was a lot of fun. And that packed the Oakland Col the Oakland Coliseum that night had uh, forty five thousand for that game. The Giants were playing across the bay, and they had like half that many people. So, <laughs> but you know, we talked football earlier and about how you covered the 49ers, and I was lucky to do that back in the eighties as well. With a lot of a lot of good times watching some great teams. Um, it, I know you grew up in New England. You're not a big Patriots fan, but what the Patriots have done since two thousand and one. It's just startling to me in this day of an age of parity where teams, it seems like every other year there's a new team on top. And yet the Patriots have always been right there, and they've won, what, four championships? What's the uh, what's the secret to that long-term success, Dave? Um, well, Belichick would be the beginning of it, I <laughs> right. believe. Again, it goes, I think it goes ownership. Kraft uh, took over the team and kept the coach he wanted eventually, and don't forget about the inflated footballs either. I you know, I just it's just it's it's amazing the Patriots are sort of the villain of the NFL right now. Uh, where the Raiders used to be sort of that way when they won a lot, the Cowboys were that way when they won a lot, you know, when they came off with America's team. And that was sort of the team that sort of I adopted as a kid and I explained that the Patriots when I was growing up weren't very good. They played at that time at Fenway Park, their games were Penn Babe Furley was a was a quarterback, uh, John Capaletti. Jim Nance, but they were the AFL then when I was growing up, and the AFL was sort of considered the minor league, and the NFL was the, was the big. Yeah, they were the Boston Patriots back then, weren't they? It was the Boston yeah. Patriots back there, and um, my dad then was a big New York Giants fan. I loved yeah. Frank Gifford when he was playing at the moment, but I just couldn't, I couldn't throw myself, and never had thrown myself by any New York, any New York team. <laughs> well, especially since I needed, I needed to find another Ooh. team, and there was one day I was over at a friend's house, and I was watching a game on TV, and there was this new team. Uh, 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 I saw on TV, and the thing I loved about them is they had these neat helmets. They had stars on their helmets. Oh, yeah. I thought that was kind of cool. So that's how I became a Dallas Cowboys fan. <laughs> In fact, my first uh, favorite player for the Cowboys was Dan Reeves, who then was a, yeah. was a running back who was an option pass, came out of Georgia through an option pass, and then called a halfback option. And obviously he went on to go coach the, uh, Bronco. uh, the Broncos and the, and the Atlanta Falcons. Um, <laughs> But, that, but that's how I sort of became a Cowboys fan, and I was a Cowboys fan until Jerry Jones took over the team. Oh, yeah. And fired yeah. unceremoniously Tom Landry, and, yeah. and uh, I think uh, I didn't like the way that went down, and so I said, you know what, I really don't care about the 40, I don't care about the Cowboys anymore. I don't really like it much. I'm sort of a closet yeah. uh, a Patriots fan just because, well, I like, I, they're coming back, and I've got my own t-shirt, the Patriot Pat, you guys remember the old Patriot 
Oh yeah, okay. the symbol of it looked like and the minute, sit, the, the, the minute man. Yeah, I love that the old old school uniform. So yeah. I'm a Patriot Pat fan more than anything else. <laughs> It's interesting though you mentioned Jerry Jones and, and then what a great rivalry they had with the Niners for about four years there. Yeah. But the but they won the Cowboys won three Super Bowls and the Niners only won one. Yeah. And and ever since then the Cowboys have been America's team. They've been the most valuable maybe sports franchise in football. But they're not very good right now. Well, I think that you know, those are the quarterback situation more than anything else. Yeah. Almost always hurt. I think that's hurt them more than anything else. And and uh, you know. Uh, until recently, anyways, uh, I think Jerry Jones has been a general manager and hasn't made some very good decisions on that. Uh, it seems like he's getting better as a general manager the last three years. I think they've been well drafting. They've built a tremendous offensive line now. Mm. Uh, and they've, you know, I already made a mistake in letting the running back go a couple of years ago. But, um, Those yeah, things they gotta happen. they got to bring back Leon Lett. Lett. Yeah. You know. <laughs> Leon Lett. <Lett. laughs> <laughs> it's an interesting thing. I mean, it's so weird in the NFL. It's, it's, you have to look what team's going to show up every week here. Yeah. And, yeah. Uh, you know, they, you know they, they, for years they were trying to build parity, and that's the, 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 the big drawing card for the, the, the National Football League. Well, parity. Well, for the 49ers yeah. to, to shut out yeah. the Rams. On opening night this year. Yeah. 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 I was like, what? Well, the Rams aren't very good, but still, I mean, that whenever you can pitch a shutout, you know, that was the first time in 49er history in 70 years that they won on opening day in, in, in shutout fashion, which yeah. is, you know, I mean, it's, it's against – Granted, it's against a team that just moved to L.A. that's not very good, but uh, nobody expected that. I mean, just the fact that they moved to L.A. should I mean, if it's the same team, I know you got new players and stuff like that, but, you know, it's not like they're going from, uh, you know, Nigeria to Alaska. It's not that kind of difference. <laughs> Let's not get too excited about the Niners. If I remember no. last year, their season opening win was over the Vikings. That's right. Yep. Adrian Peterson never got how to get the ball, and, and look how strong the Vikings were at the end of last year and, and where the 49ers were. Well, and look at who the 49ers is, as this if program airs, I'm not sure if it's airing before or after the game on Sunday, but the 49ers have to play the Carolina Panthers, who are going to be really, really upset and looking for a win after getting, you know, really, I hate to say it, almost a game stolen from them by the Denver Broncos on yeah, opening night. I, I think I have a little bit more faith in the head coach of the 49ers now than we did the previous head coach. Yeah, Chip Kelly, I think, is yeah, you know, much, much bigger and you know, much, much more of an improvement over uh, Jim Tom Sula. Yeah. You know, I gotta, I gotta throw one more thing out there about the, the Patriots. Um, I was working the sidelines with the Raiders as their uh, radio commentator on the sidelines for Greg Papa and Tom Flores were upstairs during that infamous game where Tom Brady uh, got the, the tuck the, roll, the, the oh, tuck roll. Oh, and it was in the it was in the snow and it was a bizarre game. It felt like it was being played in he played inside a snow globe. No wind, but the snow was just coming down steadily. And, and on the way home, our plane got delayed leaving Boston at a for about three hours. So we had to sit on the tarmac and stew for three hours. And Al Davis at that time is in his mid-70s, and he still you know, got it together upstairs. He is pacing up and down the jetway, muttering to himself. And one time I heard him say, they took it from us in 72, and they did it again with the Franco Harris play, and they did it again. And it is, I mean, isn't it coincidental, 72, the Franco Harris play started the Steelers' great run because they started winning championships. And the tuck rule, that game that gave the Patriots that playoff game, started them on the run. So it's interesting how sports, uh, you know, all these little quirky plays sometimes lead to amazing, amazing runs. So you're calling the Raiders a, star a dynasty starter, is that what you're saying? That's, that's, and, yeah. And you know what? And yeah. the Seahawks had that against uh, the Packers when they brought in the refs uh -huh. from, you know, these guys, one guy's doing touchdown, another guy's doing interception. Right. You remember that? Oh, I mean, yeah. I kind of started the uh, Seahawks. Yeah, yeah. That's interesting. interesting. Hey, uh, speaking of the Seahawks, how about Pete Carroll? You had pretty good um, time getting to know him a little bit. He's from Marin County or went to my high I get to know him really well when yeah. he was a coordinator for the 49ers and, and then later on as the head coach at USC. So that was back in the 90s and then more recently. Right. And yeah. I, and I get to know his family really well. They lived over uh, uh, in Green Bay and, and got to meet them. It's a nice little story I, I'd like to tell about Pete. Uh, yeah. This happened, uh, oh God, this is when he was at SC in, his, in the middle of his heyday there. Um, I took my son to a practice. I don't know if you've ever been to a USC practice really weren't fun to watch it. And I sort of did a story on their practice and how they're always moving and stuff like that wasn't successful. And afterwards, uh, Pete and I walked over to Heritage Hall. My son was with me. I think Drake was then about um, 12 years old. And Drake had always heard me tell Pete Carroll stories, so he was glad to see him and stuff like that. So well, that was the interview. And he looks over at uh, my son, and he goes, your pop's been good to me. So I thought that was... That's you know, cool. I meant a lot to me that he would say that to my son, and my son would... would understand that what it meant and that uh, that 
Oh yeah, you know, Dave. So I've always thought that you were fair. You asked good questions without being confrontational. And Pete Carroll, again, to his credit, I went to high school with him. Didn't know him in high school. He was a year ahead of me. Yeah. Interesting story. He and Robin Williams, the famous late comic, were right. in the same class at Redwood High School. At, believe it or not, in 1969 they graduated. So it's it's amazing how this is such a small world. Well, I just in a Pete Carroll story as I heard him. He used to go to Pacific Beach and literally draw plays in the sand out of Pacific Beach. And play football out there. Doesn't surprise me. That sounds like Pete. Well, the Seahawks, uh, again, they may not be quite as good as they used to be, but they he's got them playing at a high level, even with uh, Beast Mode uh, having retired. Marshawn Lynch, the former yeah. Cal star. Is he going to come back? Well, back. Eh, you know, I don't know. I, it, 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 it's interesting, uh, the story about Anthony Davis, I guess, the, the 49er lineman who took a year off, mm -hmm. then he came back, and he was a very good lineman. Took a year off, came back, and now he's lost his job, and he's a backup. And the guy who replaced him did a great job shutting out, uh, keeping Aaron Donald off of, uh, out of the face of Blaine Gabbert the other night. As a matter of fact, Aaron Donald was so frustrated, he shoved one of the 49er players, knocked his helmet off, got kicked out of the game, and then threw his helmet down. So that kind of epitomized the night the Rams were having. So uh, that's yeah. going to cost them a little bit. Yeah, it's going to cost them a little bit. Well, any other any other good stories you got for us, Dave? Because yeah, I know yeah, we have two minutes. Yeah, yeah. Good story. Uh, yeah. How about, a, how about a baseball story? Because you, you covered a lot of Giants. Okay, here's, a, yeah. here's a story I'll tell you. This is about sure. Steve Lavin. This is an election year. I'll tell next year. Steve Lavin, the former uh, college basketball coach. Yeah. UCLA, the head coach. And I went down to just sort of a day in the life of Steve Lavin because it wound up being like three days. And so <laughs> I was given all access to him uh, for this period of time. In fact, they had, he had lunch with him and Dad Cappy and Pete Newell. Uh, uh. Steve, we went to a Chinese restaurant, had lunch, and these guys are telling stories. And then they decided that they're drawing up plays on the table, waiting for the, the food to be delivered to this Chinese restaurant. And they were using, you know, salt shakers and pepper shakers and all these kinds of things. Like men on the court type thing and moving it around on the table and things of that nature. Well, that night, <clears throat> Steve had to, you know, before the game, I think they were playing Oregon. Baron Davis was on the team then, and as was Matt Barnes. Mm. And uh, Steve had to go to like some sort of a function before the game, probably about a half an hour or an hour before tip-off. And um, Olympia Dukakis and uh, Michael Dukakis were there. And Steve is in his basketball world, and, and Cap and Dad's with him. So he's going around the room, glad he ain't talking to people. He meets Michael Dukakis and stuff like that. And Steve has to get back and cover and coach the game. So we're walking out of the room where all this happens, and we're going back into the Poly Pavilion. Steve turns to his dad and goes, is that the presidential guy? <laughs> Michael Dukakis. Oh, my gosh. And Michael Dukakis, of course, ran against George Bush Sr. in 1988. Yeah. I didn't realize he was uh, related to Olympia Dukakis, the very fine uh, actress. Yeah. Uh, brother, sister, older, uh, older. She wasn't a parent, was she? No. I can't. No, I think yeah. that's a cousin. Yeah, I think they are brother, sister. Wow. That's, that's great. Again, a small world. Yeah. Small world. And Steve Lavin, again, Bay Area, local guy from... Marin County played on a great team at Drake High School when I got back here in 1982 after getting blown out of a job in New York. That's your time to face the champions. That's right. The, the Drake High Pirates had this amazing team, and uh, Steve Lavin was one of the guys on that team. So this is going back to the years. I grew up uh, with Buddy Biancolana. Oh, he good. Did, yeah, I, I saw my, I had guy. an opportunity to interview him in Kansas City when he was, just after he retired. We got together on an A's road trip, and I got to meet Buddy there, and uh, I have not seen been out here a couple times and we haven't connected yet, but uh, still keep in touch with him. Good, yeah, good, he's good a good Facebook friend. Another, re another Redwood uh, high alum from Larkspur, like Pete like Carroll. There you go. Well, Dave, stay with us uh, for just a second. We're just going to cut to our break. We're bid you farewell. Okay, who? <laughs> here's our last trivia question. Who won Athlete of the Decade honors for the 1960s? Mm. All right. Email Edward at Sports Econ 101 the answer to that question. All right. And uh, Dave, I'll be. It was now with Dominican University, previously in, with the Marin IJ. Here in, in uh, Marin County in San Rafael. We're definitely going to have yeah. to come visit you, or just down the street. Well, so, you have, I, I don't know if either one of you gentlemen, I know Bruce, you have. Has, has, has you been on campus recently? Uh, it's been a while, but they've done a lot of improvements, it's, I know. It's a beautiful campus. Yeah. There's a couple of new buildings on campus. They built a new, uh, they got a new athletic complex. It includes a, a new soccer slash lacrosse field. Uh, just Last year, they opened up a new softball diamond. Whoa. Man, those nuns have money. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for joining us again, Dave. We're going to uh, cut to our last uh, com commercial break here, and then we'll come back with some closing comments on Sports Econ 101.
right. David, thank you so much. Yeah, that was great. Us. Great stuff. I wish I could have come up with more photos. No, 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 no. You were great. No, by the way, what's the answer to the question? Yeah. I'm trying to think 60s. I might have been an Olympic athlete during the 60s. I was going to say Willie Mays, but I know Willie Mays was player of the decade in baseball, but I don't I'm know. Think of the yeah. This is athlete. Of the, yeah, it's, it's, yeah, it's, yeah, it's yeah. Athlete it's got to be somebody else. Maybe right. Muhammad Ali. I don't know. No. It, no. It, Olympia, it, Olympian, huh? No, uh, not an Olympian. Not an Olympian. No. no. Major and, sports. And, 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 uh, major uh, team it's, sport. It's, 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 it is a major sport, but it's not, you know. It's not a team sport? No. Oh, okay. Willie Shoemaker? No. Jack Nicklaus. Uh, close. Oh, Arnold Palmer. Arnold Palmer. There we go. Okay. Yeah. Got it. Well, great, Dave. We're going to have to have you on again. That was a lot of fun. Yeah. Yeah, yeah that was great. Thank you so much Thank you for so doing much. this. Good to reminisce with you, Bruce. Uh, you talked about that weather at, at Foxborough that night. I grew up and lived in that stuff, so oh, yeah. <laughs> I don't have any sympathy for you. <laughs> you. You were probably wearing sandals in uh, weather like that. I used to, literally, I, that time, I used to walk from school for two miles from my home and it would be 15 below. Oh, my gosh. Well, you live in it, when you live in it, you grow up in it, it's the only thing you yeah. know, so it's not, it's not that big a deal. When I, we had some friends who lived in Alaska, and they said that the rule was as long as it was above zero degrees, the little kids at recess were allowed to go out and play. Yeah. yeah. Probably the same thing back there. Where there you go. I remember getting to high school, and my face would be completely, like, red and frosted. <laughs> Again, you don't think anything of it because that's the way... That's the way life yeah, is. Hey, one time I ran out of suntan lotion on my way to school. <laughs> <laughs> so I can relate. Uh, <laughs> all right, Dave. Good all right. talking to you guys. Take, right. take, take care, right. Dave. Right. Take care. Uh, all right, Bye. man. Bye-bye. He's That's good. Great, great stuff. Yeah, great guy. He's a good, he's a good uh, storyteller. Yeah. Got a lot of energy. And his son, it's interesting, his son had some major health problems but they, when he was a kid, when he was like five, six years old. Uh -huh. Now he's a student at Humboldt State, he's a cross-country runner there. Wow. So okay. he's done really well. That's a Drake. You mentioned the Drake. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. All right, ready to close the yeah. ball out? Definitely, definitely. Right. I'm going to go right from here to the ballpark because i got to do a, a little uh, freelance writing. I'm doing a little story on the Giants, believe it or okay. not. Yeah, yeah. So we'll talk to Boji and whoever. Change their luck. Oh my God, that things are so bad right now. Oof. Yeah. yeah. All right, here we go. Yeah, okay. they, they, there's like how many games left? And there's five seven, games. They've got 17 days and 16 games. So you know they're half a game in, in, uh, ahead of the wild card. I know. Yeah. And and St. Louis is in town that's starting tonight. They're the okay, the, so the first will be exciting. Yeah, yeah. It'll be very exciting. All right, here we go. So welcome back to Sports Econ 101. Last time for today, I'm Edward Brown, your host, along with Bruce McGowan. Third trivia question: Who won Athlete of the Decade honors? For the 1960s. I was going to say Willie Mays or some Olympian or maybe even Muhammad Ali, but I don't think that would be true. No, in fact, I would have thought it would have been someone like Muhammad Ali. Yeah. You know, for what he had done. Yeah. But, uh, no, it was uh, Arnold Palmer. Uh, Arnold Palmer was one of the best. I mean, one of the greatest. And uh, what a nice guy. He's still around. Yeah, he's and still he, doing some of these commercials. He's got to be, what, in his late 80s? In late 80s, early 90s. Yeah, he's, he's in great shape, though. I mean, for a guy his age, he looks old, but... His mind is still sharp, and he can still move around. I'll bet he can uh, still golf better than his age. Be Possibly. You know, they, it, that's, that, that's the theory, right? I well, mean, that's the thing, right? You know, here, your age here's the thing. My dad lived to be 93. when he, he had to pretty much stop playing golf at about 89, 90. But he broke his uh, age. He, he broke his, his number several times. So. Did he really? Yeah, well, yeah, yeah, yeah. I can break twice my number. On he, he was a captain of his college golf team, though, so there you go. There he, was a, he was a good golfer. So when he was 25... Shoot it <laughs> yeah, right. I could do that on mini golf yeah. for nine holes. It's funny, I never got into golf though. I, I enjoyed covering the sport. I've covered some U.S. Open golf, and but I just I never played a whole lot. I never got into it that much. All right. Well, yeah. with that, we're going to go for our uh, thoughts of the day. Yes. Amateur boxer Joe Flanagan named his two sons Bob and Wee. That's <laughs> a good thing he didn't. He wasn't a golfer. Other mice, he might have named one of his sons Putts. <laughs> and uh, drivers kill more deer than hunters, and that's why I, I always hunt with my car instead of a rifle. <laughs> All right, tune in next. Okay, we're just oh, man, too you, much fun here. You are having too much fun oh, too today. Much. Yeah, I love it. All right, tune All right. in next week to Sports Econ 101. Oh, Why? Boy. Because we're going to be giving away more uh, vacations for mm. answering sports trivia questions, and we're going to be discussing sports topics from a business perspective. And uh, Bruce, we'll welcome you back. Do you have any guests in mind? I'll come up with uh, some interesting people. Uh, you know, maybe not Oh, wait a minute. You know what? David Vogelstein. Oh, oh yeah, there you go. Some good stuff. Last okay. Time. 
We talked about some criminal stuff in sports. Oh. So you won't want to miss that. Okay. All right. Stay that sounds tuned. good. Stay All right. tuned. The Sports Econ 101 next week. Don't touch that dial. Don't touch that dial until next week. Until next week. Okay. All <laughs> right. We're going to sign off now. Uh, I'm Edward Brown, your host. We'll see you next week. Good night, America. So long. Uh, Adam, 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 so you, so you do have a guest for next week. We do. Oh, great, great, yeah. great, great. Okay. Yeah, Colette's not going in for this thing until a week. Uh, it's not.